have strong data processing number two. So even stronger. Uh, 80 proof, how about that? <laughs> Gotta maintain the you know Russian reputation and everything. So um, while I'm erasing, I'm gonna start talking. Oh, th thanks, John. Um, so, so my talk is gonna be about um, discrete objects because you know I'm from the Midwest and in the Midwest we're all very discrete. Um, and thank you, John. So um, ah, perfect. So I'm going to look at two problems from um, discrete probability or discrete um, stochastic processing uh, problems. They're related to Markov chain Monte Carlo um, and um, correlation decaying graphical models. And we'll see how um, uh, one can actually coax a lot of interesting bounds out of um, what one would call strong data processing inequality. So I use it in a different sense, although what, what John has talked about is related. Uh, I'm going to start by looking at um, two spaces, uh, finite sets, x uh, and y. And uh, I'm going to have a stochastic mapping with input in x and output in y. Call that mapping k. So uh, it's a, you can think about it as a stochastic matrix. Um, one convenient way of thinking about it, um, instead of uh, transforming input symbols into output symbols, you can think about taking an input distribution mu on x and uh, generating an output distribution uh, mu k on y. Um, and so this is k. And this notation actually is supposed to be suggestive of the fact that you can think about probability distributions over finite sets as row vectors. In that case, k will be uh, a matrix. And transforming distributions to distributions is multiplication by that matrix from the right. Uh, equivalently, you can think about going in the opposite direction. You can think about a function f. Uh, and I'm going to denote all real valued functions on the set by f of that set. Uh, that function is going to be mapped to another function, call it kf. Uh, and that function is going to be a function on, on x. Um, so you can think about k uh, acting in two different directions. And the idea is that this is just the uh, duality between row and column vectors or duality between measures and functions. So the uh, ordinary data processing inequality says that if I were to uh, fix mu and then uh, look at the result of passing that through k, and then uh, I will take some other distribution nu, pass that through k, and then compare them in a the sense of relative entropy. We know that the ratio of the output relative entropy to the input relative entropy is less than or equal to 1. And that's, uh, that's just the standard data processing inequality. Uh, what I call strong data processing inequality is, um, is as follows. First of all, I'm going to fix mu and call up my reference distribution, reference measure. And then I'm going to look at the supremum of this ratio over all nu's that are distinct from mu. Mu is fixed. And if this is less than some constant c, which is less than 1, then I'm going to say that k satisfies strong data processing inequality with constant c at mu. Okay, um, I can see the better marker. This one is not great. What if the numerator and denominator are both infinity? I'm sorry? So, okay, so in order, in order to avoid that unpleasant situation, I'm going to assume here that uh, mu has strictly positive masses everywhere. Right, if I'm, if I'm in a uh, finite uh, uh, set situation, that's not going to happen anymore. So, um, Ah, much better. And in fact, we can, we can play this game with uh, uh, any um, other measure of divergence. So in particular, let's introduce something called the uh, phi divergence. So I'm, I'm you know, committing a bit of a blasphemy here uh, because normally one talks about f divergences. I use f for functions. So I'm going to talk about functions phi uh, from non-negative reals into reals. I'm going to assume this function is convex. Uh, 
and I'm going to assume that phi of 1 is equal to 0. And then I'm going to define the phi divergence between nu and mu simply as the um, expectation under mu of phi of nu divided by mu. And this is, of course, the rather Nicodem derivative, but you know, I'm in a discrete setting. There's no need to get all fussy with that. So, uh, and mu, I assume, is, it charges all points, so this ratio is, is, uh, is never, uh, never divergent. And I'm going to then talk about, obviously, strong data processing equality of, um, let's say, with constant c at mu of type phi if this holds. Uh, and I'm going to omit all mention of phi if phi is just uh, uh, the function t log t. So in particular, if phi of t is equal to t log t, then the corresponding phi divergence is just a relative entropy. If phi is t minus 1 quantity squared, then this phi divergence is called the chi-squared divergence. Um, if phi of t is um, 1 half absolute value of t minus 1, then the corresponding phi divergence is the total variation distance, which, of course, is also a metric, but, you know, let's write it this way. Um, so... For relative entropy, don't you need it to be just... Minus log t? Uh, no, because what, what I did it uh, what I did is I put mu in the denominator. So, um, and that so so because I always want the reference measure to be in the second slot of the divergence. Now, um, and 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 strong data processing qualities actually have a very very long history. The first paper I know of that you know, explicitly consider it in the case of divergence is, is a remarkable paper by uh, Alsvet and Gotch from the seventies with seventy six right. Um, so. And gotch. My handwriting is terrible. 1976. Among other things, and this is not the only result in the paper by far, but among other things, they proved that. Um, so let's define an, uh, an SDPI constant, eta phi of mu and k, obviously as the supremum over all nu's that are not equal to mu of the ratio of the output to input phi divergences, right? So what Alsveda and Gotch proved, as, as I said, this is just a minor result in that paper, but you know, at least it shows you something interesting. They proved that uh, the relative entropy, so when I don't write phi, that means relative entropy, of the reference measure being just a fair coin toss, Bernoulli half, and the uh, uh, channel is the binary symmetric channel with parameter epsilon, is equal to exactly 1 minus 2 epsilon squared. Um, so since then, the arbitrary phi divergence was taken up by Cohen et al. I think that paper has like six authors, 1993. They showed some interesting things. First of all, they looked at um, the case where you define eta phi of k simply by supermising over the reference distribution. And they showed the following. They showed that for any phi, um, and for any k, this is bounded by the de Bruchon constant of the channel. So maximum over all input letters, total variation distance between the corresponding output distributions. So this holds for any phi. And moreover, they also showed that this is equal to the total variation contraction coefficient of that channel. So you know, look at look at to, look at let phi be absolute, one half absolute value q minus one supermise of all mu's. This is exactly achieved. Um, they also showed a lower bound on eta phi if phi is three times differentiable and strictly con uh, convex in the neighborhood of one. And then they showed that in that case. Eta phi, well, is lower bounded by eta chi squared. And eta chi squared, so in fact, you can, so, so they showed this by you know, supermising overall mu's. 
you can actually show this point-wise. So it's a, it's a Taylor series, it's a Taylor expansion argument that works precisely the same way. But you can show that, and, and we're going to use that, uh, you can show that eta phi of mu k for any phi satisfying the same conditions, three times differentiable, strictly convex in the neighborhood of one, uh, is lower bounded by the chi squared SDPI coefficient, which, by the way, also has an explicit expression. It's the so-called squared maximum correlation, where um, maximum correlation coefficient, and this goes back to, it also has a rich history, the paper by, by Hirschfeld, Rainey, Gebelein, Sarmanov, Witzenhausen looked at it. So uh, this is the supremum over all functions on x and on g of the expected value of f of x times g of y, where the conditions are g is 0 mean, and f is 0 mean, and unit variance, where x and y here, x has law mu, and y conditioned on x has law k, condition law k. So you know, joint distribution, uh, oh, of x and y. So, so this, this, is a, this is a lower bound um, that holds pointwise for all mu. Um, and before I go on to you know, applications to graphical models, I want to actually show a quick proof of uh, this result, which actually is not trivial. It rests on a very, very uh, uh, sharp inequality having to do with uh, uh, contraction of signed measures on their Markov kernels proved in this paper. Uh, I want to show uh, a proof of the special case when the uh, stochastic transformation Q, uh, K satisfies something called the um, uh, Doblin type mineralization condition, which is going to be related to what John was showing. So I'm going to go over here and quickly write out that proof, and then I'm going to launch into graphical models. This proof is actually unrelated to the graphical models, but it's kind of, kind of a nice uh, information theoretic um, demonstration. So suppose that suppose that my k is such that um, suppose I can find a constant alpha greater than zero and a probability measure mu tilde on the output alphabet such that k of y given x that's a transition probability for for y. Uh, upon receiving x is upper, uh, lower bounded by alpha times mu tilde of y for all x and y. Then um, we can just show that uh, for any eta phi of k is less than 1 minus alpha. And the way you prove it is, uh, is a nice information theoretic proof. So consider the following. Consider, consider implementing k in the following way. Um, so let me uh, enumerate the letters in x by 0, 1, let's say m minus 1. And I have the following erasure type channel, 0, 1, blah, 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 m minus 1. And on the output, I have 0, 1, m minus 1. But I also have a special erasure symbol. And each letter goes into itself with probability 1 minus alpha and gets erased with probability alpha. Same thing here, et cetera. If I have such a channel, I can, um, by observing just the output of that, I can simulate k. How do I do that? Um, notice by this condition, I can define another channel, k tilde, um, which now also between x and y as follows. Just simply take k of y, minus, uh, k of y given x minus alpha mu tilde y divided by y mi 1 minus alpha. And by this condition, this is a, a bona fide channel. So if I see an unerased symbol, I push it through this. If I see erasure, I just generate a fresh sample from mu tilde. And you can see by, you know, by just uh, manipulating things that that's the, the composition of that, uh, that, that channel conditionally on you know, whether you see an unerased thing or, or an erasure gives me k. And that means that the uh, divergence, any phi divergence, between mu k and mu k is going to be upper bounded by the divergence 
let's call this uh, erasure channel E alpha. Divergence between nu E alpha and mu E alpha, and that is just by convexity of divergences is less than one minus alpha divergence between nu and mu. So you can see that this actually admits a very nice operational proof that you can actually show that if a channel satisfies this fairly strong condition, then it can be simulated by uh, passing through an erasure channel. Okay, so now that I've shown you these things, let me show you two applications of strong data processing inequalities to uh, two problems in discrete probability. Well, one for sure, and then depending on how much time I have left, another one. How much time do I have left, by the way? Uh, you have about uh, five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, I'll show them just one application. Um, and then, you know, if I, get to, <laughs> if I get to be picked the lucky winner, then I'll show you the other one tomorrow. Seven. Okay. Excellent. Maybe, maybe there's a chance. I see you know, <laughs> anything, anything to prevent me from giving the early morning talk. Excellent. I'll sleep longer. Okay, so, um, so let's, let's, let's consider the following problem. Suppose I have a graph, G, V, E. I assume it's simple, no loops, or multiple inches, and undirected. And, um, and then I, uh, I pick a number, uh, I pick a natural number Q, right? So natural number, well, no greater than or equal to. Cyclic. So what? No loops in the cyclic, then? Right. Okay. Uh, well, no, 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 no self loops. No self loops. No self loops. Doesn't mean no. <laughs> Doesn't mean it's a tree. Yeah, yeah it's not a tree. Um, no self loops. Okay, so Q is a number of colors, and the idea is that so I'm going to take my, as my input and output alphabet is going to be the uh, set of all colorings of G with Q colors, where I say that an element X, which is of course just an assignment of colors to vertices, is a proper coloring. Well, everybody knows a proper coloring, proper Q coloring. Uh, if whenever u and v are connected by an edge, that implies that the colors are different. And we know that um, the number of colors, number of co proper colorings of G with Q colors, uh, this is a polynomial in Q, but it's NP hard to compute. So uh, one, one nice thing you could do is, instead of counting it, you could sample from the set of all proper colorings and then do something like support size estimation, right, to, to determine uh, the value of this. Because the connection between counting and sampling is well known, but even sampling from proper colorings is difficult, so what you do is you relax it and you consider, so um, let's you know by script B not to confuse it with distributions, you instead consider sampling from a relaxed version, so you could call it the QPOTS model. Um, and you pick a parameter beta, and then you have the following probability distribution on colorings up to a normalization constant, which is the partition function. Uh, you have the exponential of beta times the product of all the edges, and then you penalize every time you violate the constraint. So even sampling from that is difficult. Um, directly. So instead, there are two, there are two well-known techniques for doing it. One is the heat bath. So heat bath. All right, so heat bath works like this. Um, and it's, it's, it's going to be a, a channel, right? So uh, K heat bath, uh, going to ma uh, map probability distributions on, on colorings to probability distributions on colorings. Pick a vertex uniformly at random. Um, sample from the conditional distribution on that vertex given its neighbors, because it's a Gibbs field, replace, leave all the other vert vertices untouched. And we know that um, the Gibbs distribution is invariant with respect to that stochastic transformation. And it's easy to implement because of the locality property of this thing. Um, the other well-known algorithm is called Swenson-Wong. Um, so this goes, heat bath goes back to Roy Glauber's work from like 1960s. 
Swanson Wang is published in 1987 or something like that. It's, it's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, the idea is that for any, for any configuration X, um, let me associate it with a set A X of edges such that um, X U is equal to X V where edge is this uh, UV. Right, so all edges that, uh, that violate the constraint. What you do to sample from uh, one iteration of, of the uh, Swenson Wong is the following. It's another Markov kernel. It's easier to describe than in words than to write down. You, if your current configuration is X, you look at the set of all the edges where the, constraints, where the coloring constraint is violated. Each edge you delete independently with probability one minus e to the minus beta then you end up with um, a graph. So you end up with a graph where you take the original vertex set, whatever is left after a deletion process is uh, the set of edges. That graph in general is going to be disconnected. What you're going to do is you're going to pick uh, a color uniformly at random for each connected component and color all the vertices with that color. Um, and, and so again, Swenson Wong, uh, the Gibbs measure is invariant. Um, so people use heat bath because it's easy to implement. And empirically, Swanson Wong seems to be fast for graphs, at least you know, for, 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 uh, for interesting graphs with a small number of colors. Uh, however, there are situations where uh, Swanson Wong is slow, and there's nothing you can do about that. So um, in 2012, Mario Ulrich proved an interesting result, which amounts to, in my language, amounts to the following statement, that um, one minus square root of the chi-squared contraction uh, coefficient of the uh, Swenson Wong kernel is greater than the following ugly looking constant, one over two Q four delta plus two E to the eight beta delta, delta is the maximum degree of the graph, times one minus square root of the corresponding contraction coefficient for the heat bath. So I'm going to show you an improvement of this bound that works for all uh, fees that um, induce an entropy invariant under scaling. Ah, I'm so awkward. That's because I'm not from California. Um, so. The proof is based on a very, very one very simple idea and one very ingenious idea of Ulrich. The simple idea is mine. The ingenious idea is due to Ulrich. The simple idea is this. Um, so it's a comparison principle for comparison principle for strong data process, uh, processing constants. And it says the following. Suppose I have a distribution. I'm going to state a simple form of it. Supp suppose I have a distribution mu and two stochastic transformations k and k bar. Um, on the, from the same input set to the, sa to the same output set. Suppose that maximum overall x and y, k bar y given x divided by k y of x is less than or equal to some constant a. Then, um, eta phi of mu k is less than or equal to 1 minus 1 over a one minus eta phi mu k bar if uh, phi satisfies a mild condition, satisfies a homogeneity condition. All it says is that um, if I were to look at this expression, expectation of uh, any function of phi of some positive random variable mu minus phi expectation of u. If I were to scale u by a positive constant, this quantity would be scaled by some function of that constant. So in particular, phi, when you get the uh, t log t that satisfies that, t minus 1 squared satisfies that. So we're going to use this. And, and this is actually, this follows from, a, from a, again, a Taylor series type of an argument, where you represent um, phi divergence as a tail of a Taylor series expansion. So this is a comparison principle. And it holds uh, for all possible uh, situations. Now I'm going to, ah. <laughs> now I'm going to use this. I have a quick question. Yes. 
At a high square is a spectral gap, so why can't you... No, no, no. It... Uh, this, this is the spectral gap. Yeah. So then Ulrich's results are just a comparison of the same clothes? No, not quite. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's related to that, but, but, but it's not as strong as it could be. Essentially, here's what Ulrich does. And it's a brilliant idea. He says, OK, instead of considering um, comparing uh, Swatson Wong to heat bath, I'm going to define the following stochastic kernel. I'm going to run heat bath. Then on top of that, I'm going to run Swatson Wong. And I'm going to run heat bath again. So because of these invariant pro variance properties, the Gibbs distribution is invariant under k. And he also proves that, in fact, if you look at any two colorings, the ratio of this kernel to the Swenson Wong kernel is bounded by uh, Q to the power 2 delta plus 1 e to the 4 beta delta. Now, if I, if I knew something about the data processing constant of k, I'd be in business. And I do because, remember this invariance condition? So that means that for any other distribution, new and then take my Gibbs distribution, uh, P B beta Q. Uh, this is going to be bounded by the square of the heat bath constant. I'm not going to write out everything. And the Swenson Wong constant times the divergence between new and the Gibbs measure. Once you realize this, then you just invoke the comparison principle, rearrange, and then you get the following bound, which I'm going to write out, and then I think it's my time to gracefully exit. Um, gracefully. gracefully. Uh, or, or disgracefully. Um, so, so, so here's the bound, which, which strengthens Ulrich. I mean, they're not that great, either of them, because of the exponents, <laughs> but, but mine is slightly better. Um, so the bound says the following. Let me just write it down, and then I'll be. So q2 delta plus 1, e to the 4 beta delta minus 1, divided by q2 2 delta plus 1, e to the 4 beta delta minus square of the heat bath. And that's, so this is, you know, it's better than Ulrich, but because of these exponents, I mean, none of them are that great. So anyway, right. well, uh, thanks a lot. Thank you. Maybe one question for I can't see who's asking the question because my eyesight is horrible. I, 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 will, I, will, I, will, I will make sure I won't miss anyone. OK. Oh, one person. So I'm, I'm trying to recall exactly what I know about Swiss and Wong. If I recall correctly, if you have a, a so this is not the coloring setting. If you have a, a thermodynamic model, the heat bath dynamics doesn't work in high dimension when you're below the phase transition point, right? Right. But the Swenson Wong does, right? Yes. Phase transition. So you would expect to see this type of qualitative change in, in anything you prove about these types of results. But, but as far as I can tell, I, I don't really, uh, it's hard to, to, to figure out the notation. But as far as I can tell, your result or Ulrich's result doesn't say anything about this, right? He wants to erase it immediately. Yeah. Remove all right. <laughs> No, I mean, here's, here, well, here's, here's the main result. There's nothing incriminating. Here's the main result. I mean, all, all, this result says the following. If, if, if heat bath mixes fast, uh, Swetson Wong is going to mix even faster. even faster. If Swetson Wong is slow, heat bath is going to be slow as well. But, but, the, yeah. but it doesn't show that there are regions in the phase space where heat bath is really bad and Swetson Wong. No, it doesn't. And I think Ulrich has, has the same sort of. Um, um, same sort of a situation because I mean, what you would want is you would want these spectral gaps to be reasonably dependent on all these quantities, you know, in, in some in some meaningful way. Like for example, you would say that somehow you want mixing time to be, let's say, you know, subpolynomial in some parameters of the graph. Then you have to invoke these, uh, you know, the Bruchin uniqueness or the Bruchin Schlossmann or something like that to say something about that to you know invoke a specific value of the uh, of the entropy contraction constant here. Otherwise, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's insensitive to, to the question of phase transitions. OK, so we'll take a break, and we'll be back in 20 minutes.